Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Mission Matters Money Podcast, your source for all things money. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres. Keep up with my book releases, book tour schedule, signings, all that other good stuff. Always love to connect with you there. And as always, if you'd like to apply to become a co-author in one of my upcoming books, just head on over to the website, missionmatters.com, and click on Become an Author to Apply. All right, so today I have Monica Profit on the line, and she's founder and CEO over at Rise Markets, and she's also co-host at the New Trust Economy podcast. Monica, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, so I'm excited to get into um, into what you're doing. I mean, I can't wait to get into the New Trust Economy podcast. Love to bring on other podcasters and promote what they're doing and spread that info to my audience. Um, love to uh, build and help grow and support the podcast community. Um, but before we get into that, Len, we're also going to talk about blockchain, and we'll get into some other things. But before we get into that, let's get into um, what you're doing over at Rise Markets. Um, first, tell us a little bit more about your company, please. So Rise Markets is a blockchain-based company that allows people to essentially shop like Zillow and buy like E-Trade. We are securitizing real estate to allow individual investors to have access to really solid, stable real estate investments that are real estate-backed, but in small increments so that we can lower that threshold and lower the barrier to entry for people to make equity access investments. Man, I love this. So you're you're democratizing real estate investing. That's awesome. Um, so can you just because I don't want to assume that everybody listening um, kind of gets the nuance of what you're doing. So can you give me like a before uh, rise marketing or excuse me rise markets what what the, what it looked like before investing and then give me an after now with rise markets and kind of the the innovation that you've made. Sure. So I can actually uh, I walked in those shoes myself. To even be able to make some of the new pivots in in building businesses, I've been building businesses for 15 years now, and to even make those pivots, I've had to juggle my own investments. And at one Mm -hmm. point, I had to sell some of my real estate to be able to launch Rise Markets. Now, I had some equity in my real estate holdings. I also had a mortgage on each one of them. And when I came time to sell those, I then, Mm -hmm. of course, got to had to take the whole thing, sell it all, and take all the equity. Now, I really Mm -hmm. didn't need to do all of that. I wish I could have just sold say, a small portion of my equity and kept everything in place because it was being managed just fine by my property managers. I didn't need to sell the whole thing. I didn't need all of the cash to do what Mm. I wanted to do. So now we're hoping to make it so people can sell a tranche of their equity and also so people that go, oh, you've got some great cash flow positive investment and you're going to sell part of it. I want to buy some of that because I don't want to have to go out and I can't get a whole mortgage and get a whole place and I don't know enough about what I'm doing, but you seem to know what you're doing. I would like to buy a piece of your project and then let people actually get in in a way. So I've already walked in the shoes of those customers. You know, I Mm. wish I could have already had Rise Markets to even get the money to to launch Rise Markets. No, that's a, that's a great story, and I knew you had one up your sleeve for me, and it just makes it, I mean, because when you think about, like, traditional real estate, like, liquidity is a big deal. So, like you said, you didn't need all the money for it, but you it's not like you could just, uh, um, like, like you said, it's not like you could sell part of it. It was being managed right. Everything was fine. Um, let's talk about the um, kind of like the secondary market that you've created, being able to, for others to be able to purchase, um, uh, you know, pieces of a project. Um, tell us a little bit more about how that works, please. So with our secondary market needs, we've seen that when you when you bring an entirely new asset class to the market, you have to not only educate people about it, like and think, gosh, you know, there's people like you that are that are on the forefront of educating people about new markets and money, but um, you also have to make give them a chance to get in and get out. And I realize that there are so many pieces to this primary issuance market and the secondary market that you don't have to reinvent every piece of that wheel. You might as well mm-hmm. use good partnerships. So we've got strong partnerships with self-directed IRAs and other platforms who want to bring new assets onto their platform so that people can get into safe investments in small amounts. And those are our big um, strategic partnerships that allow us to bring that liquidity to more people and not have to go directly out to them constantly ourselves. Let's talk about how um, blockchain technology is, is assisting you with it over at Rise Market. Well, you know, I wrote the book Blockchain 101 because I saw that even my cousins, who are very generous with listening to me yammer on and on about what I do, they still (laughs) were like, you know, they'd say, how are you doing over Thanksgiving dinner? And I'd say, oh, blah, blah, blah. And they wouldn't know anything about what I do. (laughs) You know, those poor, lovely people that love me enough 
to let me talk, but they, it never helped. And so I thought, why don't I write a book that's accessible and makes it so smart people that don't want to ask stupid questions mm-hmm, mm-hmm. can just know what this is about. Because, you know, you need to know what if, – if people couldn't understand what the Internet did, it would it'd really be too bad. So the sooner that you know about new technology, the better. Mm-hmm. But in the mm-hmm. same way, you know, the first wave of the Internet was the Internet of communication. It was the, really revolutionary to say you're going to be able to communicate with someone in Kenya – for, for free and immediately with this new Internet thing. People mm. would say, you know, oh, does that mean the USPS is just going to go away? We're never going to use stamps again? The FedEx is a booming market. You think that's just going to go away? And I could mm-hmm. say, no, but, you know, fax machines have pretty much gone away, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's some, some similarities. Well, now blockchain is like the, the finance of the Internet. So the next wave of the Internet isn't about communication. It's about money. So now you can, the big revolutionary thing is, no, soon you're going to be able to transact with someone in Kenya for free immediately. And people could say, what do you mean? The banks are going away. We're never going to use the U.S. dollar again. No, but I will tell you this, Western Union wiring money is like the fax machine, and it's going to go away. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to totally change everything, but we are going to have new digitally enabled options, and they're going to be more to do with money than communication because we're not in the wave of communication revolution with the Internet. We're in the, in the wave of money revolution with the Internet and investment revolution with the Internet. Wow, that's amazing. And so how does that work into um, in the real estate? And where do you see some of the opportunity areas there coming with this, how we pay and how we use blockchain? Because I think it's super interesting how technology is really helping in fintech overall. Absolutely. Well, FinTech is, is really at the forefront of using of, of where blockchain technology is going to take us. So blockchain technology essentially allows more um, allows everything to be done in a democratized way. So 80% of the law that's practiced in the United States, and we, as you know, are a pretty litigious society, most mm-hmm. of that is contract law, meaning it was already written down in a contract, and there's a dispute about how that contract is enforced. But if you put that contract into something that automatically enforces which is called, in tech terms, a smart contract, and in blockchain is totally doable now, you can actually put money into, say, an escrow account on its own that automatically distributes according to the laws of the contract. This now makes it so that, so you know, as we all know, if you have a contract, it's really only as good as your ability and the wealth that you already have to hire a lawyer and enforce it. And we all know that, you know, the person with the most money can usually get a pretty good judgment on their side because they can outwit and outlast and outspend their opponents. And that's just not fair because that means that what's judicious and right ends up being what's paid for and what the, the person with the most money can, can afford. So if you have your contracts all automated, you've now democratized enforcement too. And that democratizes 80% of what we consider the judicial system, of what is practiced in law. Now, the more places we can see that in place, the better. So the easiest place would be, you know, say uh, if you had a smart contract for your lease, and you went to your landlord, and rather than saying, here's my security deposit, and he writes down somewhere on a piece of paper, it's going to be held in this account, and no, I'm not going to earn interest on it, and I swear you can have it back as long as you return the apartment in good condition. And it's like $1,000. Mm-hmm. Well, you all, we all know as tenants that you can lose that $1,000, and really what, what your landlord is going to say is, what are you going to do, sue me? It's going to cost you more to get your $1,000 back out of me. But mm-hmm. it costs him nothing to keep it, and that's not fair. If it was in a smart contract, it would go into an escrow account that was automated. And with a third party coming in to check your apartment and say, nope, she didn't break the stove. There's no holes in the walls. Sorry, I've been hired as a property manager, and here we go. Check off. That thing is in good condition. They put in mm-hmm. that report, and the money is automatically sent back because it never actually went into your landlord's hands. It went into the escrow account automatically. That's what a smart contract can do on larger and larger scales. So when I saw what real estate, it's like low-hanging fruit for things like automation and contracts. Because we're dealing with real assets, we're dealing with real-time brick-and-mortar things, real people interacting around them, whether they're renting or owning, investing, looking at the cash flow. These are all things that we already have a lot of systems in place. All we need to do is automate that. So blockchain is a no-brainer for the real estate industry, not even to mention in the titling and in uh, deeds and things like that. If you can really track who owns what, you can help more people. For example, over 80 percent of the people that needed FEMA relief and applied for it in Puerto Rico after the hurricane, they didn't get it because they couldn't prove they had title to the property because the title wow. had been lost at this point. 
Yeah, these are people like real, real time needs that people have. So we need to have immutable ledgers that handle this kind of documentation, especially around homes and real estate. Wow. Um, so I want to spend a little bit of time on your podcast. So the New Trust Economy podcast. Tell us more about that, please. Well, the New Trust Economy podcast sort of fell into my lap. I have been on the speaking circuit, well, up until we all get kind of quarantined at home for a while, but I was mm -hmm. speaking for the last few years. I wrote a book. I, was, I realized I had to educate people about this new opportunity that was coming with the latest revolution on the Internet, and I caught the attention of Inc. Magazine contributor Tracy Hazard, and she said, let's co-host a podcast. You be the expert in blockchain. I'll bring the media, and let's do this. And so we've been co-hosting for a while now, about a year and a half, and it's been going fantastically. We've been educating a lot of people. We have a lot of downloads, and it's super fun. We, um, if anybody's innovating or they're investing or they think maybe re that blockchain technology might be good for their business, we want to talk to them and interview them and let that, get that word out to let more people know about the use cases of blockchain. What kind of uh, – because I love recommending good podcasts. What kind of content can the um, can the listeners expect to get? Like, so what 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 are the what are some of the shows sound like? Just so that people ha have a feel for it. Okay, so you asked me a question about secondary markets and how I was solving for that. And my solution for real estate is different than someone else's solution. So mm -hmm. one of my recent interviews was with someone who has made a secondary market. They're based in Singapore, and they're talking about how people are doing leverage trading overseas in different cryptocurrencies and assets that are both asset-backed, like real estate, and not asset-backed. And there's a lot to be talked about in how people are making secondary markets, what they're doing to create investment opportunities, how we've learned some lessons from the ICO craze, what, uh, what to look for, what not to look for, but also even in things like that are very tangible, like supply chain, there are people that have made uh, immutable ledgers for supply chain to um, ensure things like that organic produce truly is organic or um, this uh, valve for a ventilator is actually, it, it actually passed all the tests that you're saying it passed and it's actually good. So we have ways of making sure that those things are not just a label that you could easily fraudulently change, like a Louis Vuitton kind of brand, mm -hmm. but it's really, truly immutably in there. And that's what blockchain does. So we take people from kind of learning and knowing nothing about blockchain to diving deep into one of the business use cases for it. Man, that's exciting. Um, so, Monica, if somebody's listening to this and they want to learn more about your work or to follow up, um, what's the best way for them to follow you and to connect on, on all your projects? Well, you can do Monica Profit. At Monica Profit's my handle, but, you know, spelling my name is a nightmare because it's Monica with a K and Profit with two Fs and two Ts. You can find me at risemarkets.io, and you can also check out Blockchain 101 for my book, Blockchain 101, on Amazon. Fantastic. Well, hey, Monica, really uh, been a pleasure having you on the show and enjoyed uh, getting into our conversation on how you're changing the real estate game and also what's going on in blockchain. And to the audience, as always, thank you for tuning in. Hope you got a lot of value out of this. If you did, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast, Mission Matters Money. Um, leave me a review on the Apple iTunes Store. And if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, um, Mission Matters Money, don't forget to uh, give us a subscribe there, but also leave us some comments in the comment section. Love to hear what kind of projects and what kind of things you're working on. And Monica, thanks again for coming on the show.